At this point, I say ask away. Otherwise, I'm going to just start talking uh, if anybody has a quick question. Otherwise, we... Uh, uh, yeah, Scott's got a question, or is he just joining us? No, I just joined. Just um, so, okay, great. Uh, so, uh, just we did have a major release this week. Podman 3.0 came out, um, and uh, we're really excited about it. It's our first version that we say we support Docker Compose with it now, so you can actually use Podman as a uh, uh, socket-activated um, service for Compose. Um, so you should be able to handle that. Uh, lots of new features, a ton, a ton of new features. And I have a talk um, on Saturday, uh, well, Saturday morning, 6.30 my time, which I think is uh, like 12.30 your time, uh, 6.30 a.m. on the new features of Podman. So I'll be talking a lot about it at that point. Um, and um, let's see, uh, Valentin, what would you like to talk about? I, I'd still love to see you Anything dance. interesting you mentioned it before. That would, that would be, <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. No, nobody wants to see that. I, I think last year, if I recall, uh, we were talking about, you know, your, your Goldilocks and the three, three bears. I deliberately right. say bear, not beer, because it was always confusing to me with <laughs> the Boston mm -hmm. accent. Um, where where we wanted to, or we wanted to push it um, uh, a little bit more forward, the idea of using SecComp and distributing it in, in images. Um, so we didn't get that that done um, in the past year. I think we were very busy getting. 2.0 out the door and now 3.0 out the door. And I think this was a lot of work uh, for the for the entire team, also with the help of the community. And now I'm personally personally looking forward to you know stabilize more on on the features that we delivered. And I think where we are now is a pretty pretty cool place to be because you know now I think we're truly a drop-in replacement for for Docker because now we have the API compatibility. Um, Docker Compose is, I think, the, the huge thing now also for, for 3.0. Now I'm looking forward to to, to go a little bit be beyond um, that and um, go 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 back to the the uh, how to say to the more uh, innovative mode. Right. Last, I think the past year was uh, right. a lot of work w went into really achieving or fulfilling the promise of the, the compatibility with, with Docker on the API level in this case. We had it before on the CLI level. And I'm really looking forward to, to push it uh, forward. The, the ideas uh, ideas that we're having, Giuseppe's working on some incredible stuff on, on SecComp at the moment to, to make it easier. So I, I think there's a lot of cool, cool stuff happening uh, at the moment. Yeah, I think uh, you know, so. For those that didn't attend last year, when my my talk was about container security, and that um, we basically came to the sort of the middle point of of security, where we if we go too hard on security, people end up everything starts breaking, and people start turning it off. And if we go too loose on security, it's it's you know what's what's the purpose? Um, so what we were trying to do is get to you know what what I would say is is you know, Docker got to a certain level of security, and I believe Podman's gotten to a higher level, especially with rootless containers and things like that. But basically, we're all using the same SecOp rules. We're all using the same, you know, list of default capabilities and things like that. And, and the question I was at bringing up last year was, you know, how can we how can we get better about this? And and one of the ideas I had was that we start putting more information into the image, so that the container engines like Docker and Podman could, you know, for this image, I can run with you know this tight of security so that um, uh, the applications could, and and over time, you know, we 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 developed some ideas, we developed some tools, but as as Valentin said, we got wrapped up in the day to day uh, work of getting Podman 3.0 out and and getting to the point where we had uh, compatibility. We, we felt that doing Compose uh, support was, was more important. Um, so yeah, going forward, we, we did over the last year add additional security to, you know, so now if you're using Podman 3.0, we actually are using less capabilities than we used to. Similar, uh, we dropped a couple of capabilities from our default list. 
Um, we've done other things in security, but but hopefully over the next year, we're going to you know, increase that so, uh, so much more. Um, there are some uh, you know, really cool features coming in the operating system this year for helping out rootless. So rootless containers is sort of is, is what I see is the, is the future of containers because you know, you're instantaneously have a, a layer that protects you from root and um, um, just by you know, allowing users to launch containers in the home directory, but there's lots of things that sort of don't work great right in that environment and don't uh, uh, you know, perform as well. And so I, I'm constantly working with the, the kernel engineers um, inside and outside of Red Hat to say, you know, can we do better? You know, can we do, you know, can we run overlay, native overlay file systems as root on, uh, as non-root on, on systems? Can we uh, take advantage of, of, you know, using NFS home directories uh, to run my containers. You know, what what can we always, you know, what can we enhance? And that, that's sort of what we're going at. Going at. So we have a few questions out here. Um, all right. It'd be better if someone else read these. But, I can uh, for you. Question: for Since you mentioned Compose, yeah, go ahead. All right. So first one is: Since you mentioned Compose, where are we now in feature parity for Docker and Potman for the regular developers that are used to work with Docker and want to migrate to Potman? Uh, we we would say that we're pretty much one hundred percent there now. There are certain features of, of Docker that will never support, <clears throat> like Podman, have a Docker Swarm. There won't there won't be a Pod, Podman Swarm. We believe that Kubernetes is the future. Um, there are some deprecated features of Docker that we didn't implement, like. Uh, uh, they have a link flag when they run containers to link two containers together, but they, they've gone away from supporting that. Um, but you, usually if you, it, it, it's difficult to say, you know, we're 100% compatible with, with uh, Docker uh, from all use cases, because uh, it, it, what we would say is for rootful containers, we should be 100% compatible, but often people are comparing Docker root Rootful Docker versus rootless Podman, and there are just certain things that are not allowed inside of the operating system to be done in rootless mode. Um, or we have to use uh, sort of compromises, like you know the, the way we set up networking in rootless mode, or the, the way we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're using Fuse overlay file system. So that's a, a user space file system that is not necessarily going to perform as well as uh, a, a kernel based file system. Uh, so the, this. Uh, but for the most part right now, if, if if you open up a bug that we believe is, if you open up a bug that we believe is not a bug in Docker, we will, um, that shows a difference between us and Docker, we will fix it. Um, and, you know, that's that's basically the way we're, we're running at this point. All right. If I look at the counter correctly, we're 718 people at the moment. This is fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're looking. You're looking at the wrong counter. We're, we're at 96. All right, all right. So 720 is the full it's conference. Full conference. So you look at the one inside. Uh, still fantastic. Yeah. All right. But 100, 100 people coming to this is is a lot of people. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're surprised. Yeah. Uh, all right, this was the first one. Thanks for asking. The next one is hi, container folks. I've got a question. As a personal outside the box challenge, currently I try to participate in open source projects without providing code. So maybe you can discuss a little what things are that you do in your community that could use two more hands or another brain, but doesn't require pushing code. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, is Tom Sweeney here? Um, he could answer this a little bit, but basically we're always looking for documentation. So. Uh, the funny thing is, you know, often when people report issues and in, in, in any of our upstream projects, I always ask them to contribute, you know, and especially if it's bugs. Uh, and this might be a U.S. thing, but I call it the Tom Sawyer, where we always trying to get other people to paint the fence for us. Uh, so if you don't know Tom Sawyer, uh, that's look it up. And uh, uh, but uh, also just opening a bug, opening an issue, you know, telling us what you, what you don't like or, or mentioning a feature that you would like to see in, in the tool, and then we can discuss it and look at it. Uh, but there's lots of documentation, lots of man pages, lots of, uh, you know, we're asked, uh, we ask people to blog about the way they use certain technologies. Um, so there's lots and lots of way, you know, any, you know, going to your community meetings and saying, hey, have you tried um, Podman instead of Docker, uh, you know, have you, 
uh, tried this. So anything like that is, is very helpful. But you know, we're, we're a bunch of engineers, and engineers tend not to like to write documentation. So if people can come in and help us document our stuff better, um, that's always appreciated. Also help test. Um, we have, so oh, yeah. we started to, um, especially now for, for 3.0. Um, so before we cut or released 3.0 last week, we were for a couple of weeks in the mode of release candidates. So, you know, this is where we're, where we're closing somehow the, the, the features that we get in. So we want to stabilize, we cut release candidates. So it's like, I, I don't know whether it's a beta or, or alpha, I would say it's more close to, to a beta. Well, it's a release candidate um, where we're, we can use all, all helping hands for, for testing, um, especially on systems that we are not using because most, most developers are using, using Fedora or RHEL, uh, some are CentOS. Um, so typically Ubuntu or Debian is less tested than Fedora, just purely by, by less developers uh, using it. So I think helping to test release candidates would also be hugely, hugely appreciated. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add one too, Valentin and, and Dan. I'd add like finding new use cases, right? Like um, I'll give you an example. Like when we came up with UBI Micro and we were, we were thinking add packages to UBI Micro if there's no RPM or yum in there. And so then Dan and I started to chat about like, well, could we do overlay mounts and image mounts? And it's like all this tricky stuff you could do. Like the question is like, like that's a place where like an end user could easily hunt a new use case and something that we hadn't thought of and like propose those kinds of ideas. Um, you know, one that came up on the last one I did was like somebody proposed like a curl minimal, like, which then it sparked me to think about like, if we had a curl image, maybe a curl minimal image would actually be, be the best way to do that. Like just asking those questions around use cases and like finding ones that are common that, that like, you know, a bunch of people would use is very useful, I think. Brent just joined. So what what are people yeah, what are people's biggest pain points with containers at this point? You know, what what are you guys seeing as you know deficiencies, things that you would like to see better? Well, people add more questions. I'll I'll, Nothing. I'll tackle the Crickets. next one. <laughs> yeah, if you have more questions, so yeah, go for the it. The next yeah. one is the CKI team is using Docker and Moby on Fedora 33 and CentOS as a backend for GitLab runner. Now, with the kernel moving to GitLab.com, they would be interested to know whether using Potman as a backend for GitLab runner via the API compat layer is within scope and reach. I think Brent will be happy to talk about that. Yeah, Brent, Brent can do that one. I just repeat that. Can you guys hear me okay? Not yeah, clear. can you just, just repeat yes. that one more time? Because I we're having trouble getting logged in on anything but Chrome. So a bunch of us are having to switch over to Chrome. Right. So the question is, um, now with the compat layer for, for Docker, if it's possible yeah. to run the GitLab runner backed. Yes. Um, in fact, we have, um, we have several um, people doing that that uh, are pretty handy at it. Um, they're on IRC on Freenode with us and we can identify them if they so choose. Um, and we've been doing some work uh, and well, we've been helping the GitLab runner proper folks to also uh, get this working on their end. But um, I believe that as far as runner jobs, um, it's, it's working quite well. Um, and, uh, and people seem to, once they get it working, they seem to just be happy and wander off. So that's, that's kind of what we like. And there was also, I think if you Google, there was a, a blog by one of the gentlemen that got it to work that might be of help. Uh, so you can consider taking a peek at that. Yeah, I was just going to add Brent, like, uh, like, like you mentioned, but I'll say a little more explicitly, like Red Hat is working with GitLab, the company to also 
essentially officially document and test from their end. So like the official product from GitLab will also eventually um, support Podman and then we'll actually have docs for it on their end and it'll be tested in their CI, CD, et cetera. So they're, they're still working on that, but, um, but it's definitely on the roadmap and we're working on it together. So it's pretty cool. In case you're interested, uh, I just pasted a link to the blog that Brent mentioned. Thanks, Mountain. Yep. Yeah, something else we plan on uh, spending uh, some serious effort on and, and could probably use some help from community is, is getting better uh, Mac support um, and getting basically with, with the advent of the remote API, we you know, our goal here is to get, um, you know, Mac and Windows uh, users and, and get the best experience possible on, on Mac and Windows. Um, so, you know, the, the, the thing, the fundamental thing about containers, you have to realize is you know, when people say containers, they, they, they really tend to mean Linux containers. And in order to run a Linux container, you need a Linux kernel running. And um, so, even people who run things like Docker and Podman on on a Mac are actually talking to a uh, an instance inside of a VM that's running uh, a version of Linux. Um, so we're we're working on what we plan on working on over the next six months is to to make you know that that first initial experience when you run Podman on a Mac um, to help it download a VM and and get the entire system set up for you and make it as seamless and easy as possible for the user. Um, similar, we've been uh, working a little bit, or at least the community's been working on um, Podman on top of WSL and WSL2. I, I never know which one to call it at this point. Uh, but the, um, and, and you know, we've been following along on that and we try to help out as, as much as possible. But uh, anything we can get the community to, to work on other platforms, um, you know, and, and have it communicate back to uh you know, and figure out how we can best do that uh, going forward would, would be great. Dan, if I may, um, I wanted to just follow up on your Compose question because I was struggling with the browser at that time. Did um, did you mention that Compose was root full only? Okay. Uh, I did so that, not. That's one point we should drive home is that the, impl the, the implementation of Compose requires it to be used as a rootful uh, Podman. And that's that's somewhat dictated by how Docker Compose works in itself and somewhat um, and it's somewhat uh, pushed by the fact that uh, our uh, our backend networking for rootless is not the same as rootful. So it's a, it's an item we're working on, but it's important to know that um, that that needs to be rootful at this point. Yeah, I think that that's a great, great point. But hopefully, by it, within the next six months, we will. I think it, I think that's more than month. feasible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brent and Dan, a popular one in the thread now is becoming Mac support. A lot of people are saying Mac plus plus. So maybe Brent and Dan, you could talk about future Mac support. Well, I think Dan hinted at it. I'm going to start working on it in about about a week and a half. Um, and our our vision is to be to provide a, a user experience Dan has in his mind, which is um, you click this and it just works, including making um, and including making it uh, on the Mac natively work with uh, with a VM running in the background, so to speak, uh, sort of similar to is it Docker Machine they call it now. And so we've yeah. Docker desktop. Docker, Docker desktop. At this yeah. Point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are working towards that goal, uh, and. And that work will start in the next week and a half in terms of sort of figuring it out, laying it out, um, coming up with an agreeable plan for how that might work for the team. And uh, then we'll begin implementing it. Yeah, so that, I mean, that again, the interesting thing there is, you know, we're gonna do this as 
you know, is an open source project. So we might have a default operating system that we download with the tools that we provide. Um, but with our goal also is to have people experiment, maybe use other other types of virtual machines. We have to figure out how we can uh, make that easy for them to, to to use, so that we're not hard coding people into, you know, perhaps our favorite distribution, but uh, allowing them to uh, to work and customize. Um, I, we see uh, Giuseppe is on the line here, and Giuseppe is our uh, tends to be our crazy guy. He goes off and really experiments with deep parts of the operating system, so. I want him to just talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, advanced features that he's been looking at, maybe around pulling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's a hot topic you now. Containers tools like uh, uh, lazy pulling an image. So, like uh, Container D has this feature already through CRFS, um, and yeah, I was looking. Uh, you know, we can use something similar. Not just for uh, the use case where uh, let's see pulling uh, uh, an image, but also to improve the regular pull operation. Like uh, what happens now that if you change a single file in a tarball, you end up uh, pulling the, the full tarball again. So I was looking for a way to improve uh, this part and uh, Basically, have a way to, to uh, for clients to pull just what's what's changed in the remote image. Like if you have, if you already have locally most of the files, there is no point to repull all of them again. Just just what's changed. Uh, yeah. So this is something I'm working on. The constraints are that uh, it must work with uh, what we have now with. Uh, uh, well, with the registers, without without changing how images are stored uh, remote, so this is the biggest constraint uh, that I'm well, looking at. So, yeah, I think you know, just to just to dig deeper into that. So, so there's been a lot of efforts. You know, if people understand the way uh, container images work right now. Is there's just a tab ball uh, with a whole bunch of content and then a JSON file that describes the tarball. And you know, so when you pull down an image, you see like these different layers coming down. Each one of those is sort of an individual tarball. Um, and that's just the way it was designed when Docker first did it um, back at the, you know, 2011 or something. And so there's been efforts, to, there's been thoughts about how we could change the way that works to make it more efficient, right? So as Giuseppe said, if you, there's it, two, Two things to think about here. So if I just want, if I have a big image, say it's you know 100 megabytes, and all I'm going to run is bin ls, you know maybe I just pull down the bin ls and the other you know libraries that it needs, and that executes, and that's that's one way of of doing this. Another one is now I have an image, I've already pulled it down, it has you know 100 megabytes of stuff on it, and I change the man page in the image, and I push a new image up. Because it's a tarball, we have to pull down the entire tarball to the host, and it has all the content that I already have in the host, plus the small change to the tarball. Um, and so, so there has been ideas about well, we could use something other than tar, or we could use some other uh, format. The problem is we have a huge installed base of, of container registries out there that don't know about this new format, and we have a huge installed base of clients. So if all of a sudden you know, if, if Podman comes out here and just says, okay, we're smarter than everybody else, we're going to start pushing these images that no one else in the world understands. You know, we're going to get, you know, people are going to say, well, no, it doesn't work with my, doc. you know, I do a Podman build and it doesn't work with my ex existing Docker or Kubernetes environment. I don't want your, you know, you're, you're breaking um, constants. So with Giuseppe and, and the other upstream developers are looking at is how can we continue to support all of the registries that are out there, how can we make minor changes to say potentially the entire format in such a way that the existing registry, existing tools can continue to pull it. And then tools that understand more about say the formatting inside of the top wall is um, and take advantage of it. So the, 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 these are the, but that's the road we have to work, work right? Because of our, because of the use yeah, of the, the tools. The way I'm looking at it, there is a little small 
breaking change because it, uh, it's using a different uh, compression format. Uh, so, but that's really a minimal change for existing uh, container engines. I even opened okay. up a request for Mobi to support it. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, our goal there is to get if, if we are going to change some format, then we have to get, yeah. you know, obviously Docker, uh, or, or Mobi, uh, Container D, which is uh, Cryo. You know, all the stuff that's used in Kubernetes. We have to get sort of the entire um, ecosystem of containers to be able to support it, um, um, and and that's why we have to work upstream yeah. for for those type of issues. Yeah. Another cool feature that uh, we were working on recently. Uh, is that overlay in the kernel got a new mount flag volatile it that's basically it allows to optimize some workloads uh, for example building images that is uh, if you if you're familiar with yum or apto they work like if you sell a package they will uh, basically call f sync on each file so that will slow down installation of packages uh, significantly because uh, uh, well, they are designed to run on the host, not in a, in a container. In a container, there are different. Uh, uh, if if a build fails in a container, we just throw throw away the entire container and start again. There is no uh, no need to make sure that the files are really written to the storage. Uh, so th yeah, this got into. Uh, I forgot now if a couple of releases ago in the Linux kernel, one release ago. Yeah, and we are starting uh, at, well, impl implementing it in our tools. Uh, yeah, also. Yeah, to get to, 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 I just wanted to dig into that a little bit deeper and explain why this is important. If you're running, uh, if you're running an operating system and you're creating content in, on the operating system, and the kernel crashes, you know, you you basically want your data to be stored to the disk. And so what the kernel does regularly is, is does what's called an F-sync, which basically takes the file that you that you thought was completely written to disk, it's actually written to memory. And when F-sync happens, the, the, the memory that, that uh, the kernel understands is actually physically written to disk. And that obviously slows down the entire operation. Because when, you do, you know, when you're doing a DNF or a YUM install, um, or any uh, probably at, um, apt and everything else, when they're writing content, they, they want to make sure that the content is actually makes it to disk when they're done. So if you're inside of a container and you're doing all that, that's that's all well and good, except that and when you're building a container image, we don't actually commit the thing that you want, the, the image, until all of the files are done and that last commit stage goes. So all of the syncing that's going on when you're installing a package is actually slowing down the kernel because the kernel is constantly, okay, I got to write it to disk, I got to write it to disk. If during a, a, a Podman build, the, the operating system crashed and you came back up, that install, that partial install is totally useless to you. So why are we spending so much time syncing the disk? Another use case where this might be important is if you're doing a Podman dash dash rm so i'm running a container and basically i don't i want the container destroyed when the system you know it, you know when i'm done running the container well if during that running time i'm running that container the system crashes you know i didn't care about sync because that that as far as i'm concerned that container is useless to me right it should be it should be removed from the system the last use case is kubernetes when kubernetes runs um containers it it runs all of its container you know, any of the containers that it creates uh, during its run are totally destroyed if the machine crashed. So when the machine crashes and reboot, you don't care about. So we're paying a heavy overhead for three or four use cases in container world where we don't, you know, we don't really need the overhead to do it. So what we're, uh, what Giuseppe has done is he's gone to the overlay guys and the kernel guys and said, why don't we have a special option that we say, turn off the, all the syncing so that we can take advantage of the way containers run. And it should be that should be showing up. It's not in Podman 3.0. It'll be uh, later this year. Um, it's actually that the pull request just converged into Builder. Uh, Speaking of Builder, there was a question there. Maybe Tom or Dan, you'd like to field about Builder from Dimitri. I'm interested whether Builder will be able to build container images work in OpenShift with restricted SCC. So 
Okay, I get. I, I probably should take that one. So let, let's talk about. So restricted SEC, as far as OpenShift is concerned, means that you have one UID um, inside of a container, and you're running as non-root in that container. So the, the standard OpenShift um, environment says that you have one UID. So when I do a build, you know, if I'm pulling down a, an image that on, onto my system, that's going to have to run, um, you know, it's going to create root files and it's going to create, say, say you're the Apache user UID 60. So when I pull down that, that content to my disk, I have to write out all the content as UIDs, you know, it's, it's root of my container and whether that's, you know, I have to write out all that content. And then there's suddenly going to be a file that has to write out with a different UID. So fundamentally, when I'm doing builds, I need more than one UID inside of my container. Um, so when we currently, when we run builds and, and OpenShift, if you're using the source damage or any of that tools, it's running with a different, uh, it's not running with the restricted, it's running with a different uh, um, Kubernetes YAML file to define you know, how, how it can run because it fundamentally needs multiple UIDs. Now, almost everybody that runs Kubernetes with containers that need multiple UIDs is running those as fun as root. Um, so they start with UID, you know, UID zero is UID zero and, and, and so on. And that's how most people are doing builds at this point. Um, secondly, uh, I know there has been some efforts to sort of hack out um, and, and Giuseppe can talk about this in, this in a minute, but um, to hack out the file system to allow you to you say chone to a different UID and we could fake it out and say it's, it's still the same UID. But even in a, in a Docker file, um, you have the ability to say, I want to run this process as this user. And so just having the user line inside of a Docker file would cause us to have to have the multiple users inside of the uh, outside of a build. So bottom line is we have to run with, in order to get multiple users, we can't use the lockdown, um, uh, the, the tightest uh, mode of security in, in OpenShift. Um, but one of the things that Kubernetes up to this point has not taken advantage of is user namespace. So when you're running rootless podman and rootless builder, um, you're taking advantage of user namespace in that case, because you're not running any processes as root, but inside of user namespace, you're able to do root-like things. Um, and so what we've gotten into, uh, into upstream cryo at this point is uh, there's a way to specify a, um, a attribute um, to cryo to say i want to run this container this uh you know this this pod inside of a specific inside of a user namespace and, and cryo will go out and allocate the user namespace for you so what's what's going to be happening in the future in source in, in, in the in building inside of openshift now is they're going to be specifying uh for all their builds a different user namespace or get a, a different user namespace for the build so that all of the builds will be isolated from each other based on uids and none of them will actually have real root inside of the containers um so that right now we're doing that as an extended um, as a uh, attribute of uh, that you could send in basically a, a sort of a secret to cry out to say do this because kubernetes doesn't understand it so we're working with the upstream Kubernetes to get this in as a full-fledged part of Kubernetes. And what we're hoping for is sometime in the future, Kubernetes will be able, you'll be able to specify in Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes YAML file, that you want this container to have multiple UIDs, but to run in a different user namespace so that you would still have a lockdown container from the, the idea that it only has a few UIDs and none of those UIDs are root. Um, and be able to do things like builds or um, I have, there's lots of custom use cases that have come to us and say where they need to have multiple UIDs inside of a container. And, and the future to me is using namespace for that type of, yeah, that's the best we can do. Any other questions? All right, talk about other stuff then. The um, let's let's talk about. Uh, I'll bring in Giuseppe again, and uh, we can talk about uh, support for NFS. Uh, home yeah, directories. yeah. So the support for NFS has the same issue that Dan was talking about. <laughs> uh, like 
the NFS server doesn't know about user namespace. So whenever, whenever a container is running inside of a user namespace, uh, and it gets some, and even if you're uh, uh, unprivileged user has full uh, capabilities, for the NFS server, it's uh, it, it doesn't know about that. It's uh, so if you try to show a file to different users that are present in the user namespace, uh, the NFS server would uh, refuse that request because from the all it sees is a, a request like to to change uh, ownership of, of a file that it, uh, to a user that it's different than the user that made the original request, which is uh, which is allowed by the local kernel when running locally because it well it has understanding of the user namespace and uh, can check whether the user has capabilities for doing that. Uh, so what we what we have done is the to trick uh, uh, NFS server to to store this information in a, an extended attribute so that the file ownership is not changed for the files. Uh, a user can uh, well all the files will be owned by the uh, the same uh, uh, unprivileged user that created the user namespace. Uh, and, and this is handled by a fuse file system, fuse of LFS that we are using now for uh, uh, rootless containers. Um, so whenever a container try to change ownership for a file, the fuse of LFS will store the, the information in a, an extended attribute so that he can pick, he can keep the well, the original file ownership on the ser on the NFS server. And uh, well. And that's the other way around. Whenever a file is uh, opened, the fuse of LFS will read the real well, owner, uh, UID and GID from the unextended attribute. Uh, so yeah, this will enable uh, running user namespace and using NFS as a backend. If you if you will access these files outside of uh, fuse yeah. of LFS mount, you will see that they are whole, owned by the same uh, user, uh, and even the mode it's a uh, uh, seven five five, so it allows everyone to read that. Uh, yeah. So if you don't go through fuse of LFS, you will see uh, the wrong ownership on the on the files. Uh, yeah, so it, fundamentally, we can we, we've got code to be able to do this at this point, but it required a change to the Linux kernel. Um, so uh, just and this happened back in December. Uh, the kernel uh, NFS did not support standard extended attributes, so us being able to write an extended attribute to the file system would not be recorded by. Uh, the NFS, well, the NFS server would not understand the extended attribute, and that feature just got into the 5.11 kernel um, two months ago. Um, so, because of that, we're going to have this feature in Fedora to uh, Fedora and RHEL very quickly. But we have to work with uh, sort of the upstream vendors that are doing, um, you know, like NetApps of the world, um, to get it out to them so that they could support um, this environment because. You have to deal with the client server nature of, of uh, containers. So, uh, Tom, let's. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, our monthly sure, I can talk uh, a little container bit about that. Uh, What we've meetup? been doing is having a community meeting on the first Tuesday of every month, generally at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we've been opening up for topics from from the community. Mostly, it's been from Red Hat, but this coming up one, we've got a couple of folks who are not Red Hat oriented that are coming in. So I'm very excited to see that. And if you're looking for info on the meetings at any time, it's out on Podman.io. And if you look for the community button on the left side there, it's underneath that menuing system there on that page. And love to have you at any time. It's free of cost. We run it for via Blue Jeans, similar to this conferencing here. Open for questions generally at the end. So if you have anything that you want to 
talk to us about it. It does say Podman community meeting, but we're happy to take anything topic wise or question wise for Scopio, build a container images or storage or anything else that's inside that realm underneath the containers on GitHub. And yeah, we'd love to have you join you, join us at any time for that. All right, uh, Chris Kay's got a question for uh, that. I think Brent's going to take it. it uh, and she's asking, uh, do you see Podman as a library of backend similar to Container D and other tools that can consume uh, to add container functionality? Are both APIs, LibPod, GoLive, REST API, Docker Socket. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Uh, basically, he's asking, can we use uh, LibPod? Yep, so here's, other here's where it is today. The, uh, API. And um, today, uh, we generally tell people not to use the go code inside of LibPod proper directly. Um, there's quite a bit of API calls, and we don't, what we really need is an upper level series of calls that can be consumed by folks that aren't on this team and make it easier for them. And we don't have that today. And that way, when we have this upper level API call, when we change the lower level stuff, uh, you know, you guys won't suffer from signature changes or whatever else. So uh, as far as going directly in, we don't advise that yet. And we do have a work item to create an upper level library that I, I assume uh, Matt Hian will implement um, when the priority is is good is uh, is as such. That said, we do have um, we do have a good series of Go bindings that that consume the REST API, and that's what Podman Remote uses. So they're uh, well tested, well maintained in that regard. They, uh, I will admit, they're a little heavier weight than we would like, and we're going to work to to skim off that weight here in Podman three dot whatever. We should be able to begin to sort of uh, address that issue, and then we are working on a set of Python bindings that also consume. Um, that also consume the REST API, and they are the they are called Podman Pi, similar to Docker Pi. Both Docker Pi and Podman Pi should work on the REST API today. The Podman Pi are still in a work in progress, and they have not had a version released yet. Uh, and on the topic of Podman Pi, we uh, would be happy for contributor help there. If folks want to come in and help knock those bindings out, uh, we would be appreciative of that. Brent, can you elaborate a bit on what you meant with uh, bindings being being heavy? I just want to make sure that uh, oh, uh, the audience doesn't misinterpret it for yeah. being hard to use. Because I think they're, they're, they're pretty they're simple to use and cool. They're simple to use. There's no performance issue when I mean heavy or anything like that. But um, for those that have programmed in, in Go, you know that there are things called dependencies and imports. And um, right now, our bindings end up uh, importing some fairly heavyweight, uh, so large maybe is the right term, uh, dependencies that we really don't need. And so we need to work to strip those off, and that will result <clears throat> in less source code being consumed and compiled. And of course, then the binary size will go down. OK, since we haven't got another question, I'm going to throw this one. So Valentin, you've, you've added this feature called uh, uh, short names expansion, I guess, or something. Could you talk a little bit about that? People will be seeing it with Podman sure. 3.0 that so, they've never um, seen before. Maybe maybe somebody in the team can can uh, look up the the blog post and, and paste a, a link to it. So if you want to catch up, oh, Brent Brent is doing it. Uh, cheers. Um, so when you do a Potman pull Fedora, um, or let's start differently. So when you do a Docker pull Fedora, um, Fedora doesn't point to a registry, right? So, so what we refer to short name. So Docker 
resolves it in a very specific way. Namely, it always resolves to docker.io. Um, this is understandable. Uh, well, they, they own Docker Hub, and it makes sense to resolve to uh, to, to their registry. And at the beginning of, of Docker, there was pretty much only Docker Hub. So also, <laughs> for historical reasons, it's understandable why a Docker resolves to Docker Hub only. But today, um, and for many years, actually, there are more public container registries. You know, there's Quay, pretty much every large software vendor has a registry, Red Hat, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. Um, there's also lots of on-premise uh, on premise registries running um, at companies. So um, Potman and its sibling projects, and actually also the Docker daemon from Project Atomic um, implemented a, a different way which allows for resolving the short image names to more registries than just Docker, the Docker Hub. So there's a cool um, config uh, called registries.conf that all these tools uh, read, etsy slash containers slash registries conf, it's the system-wide one, where you can specify the, what we call the unqualified search registries. So Portman, or all versions prior to Potman 3.0 and Builder 1.19, what they were doing, what the tools were doing uh, when you were pulling from or pulling a short name, they will go through the list of the specified registries. So let's assume there's the regist Fedora registry, Red Hat registry, and then Docker Hub. They will go through the registries in the specified order and try to pull the image. The first successful pull wins. And well, this, this worked for a long time until uh, last year we were notified by um, the security team at Red Hat that there is a certain risk. Um, uh, namely, when people are able to squad or take over repositories on a registry. So if you want to pull uh, an image, uh, for instance, Fedora, and you have uh, the, the list specified in a specific order, um, an attacker could take over, um, uh, could take over or ownership over an image of a registry that is uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning. So bad things can happen. So somehow we were in between a rock and a hard place because we, we love this feature, right? We don't want to lock in our users, and I think we're all to blame. Humans by nature are lazy. I don't. I, I even I keep forgetting the registry of of Red Hat because I think it's access dot registry dot. I, I don't know. You know, I, I keep I keep forgetting it um, because I I usually don't have to worry about it because it's in this registries con, so I can just do apartment pool UBI eight, and I'll be uh, I'll be happy. But we also had to make it secure. One way, and there are two new things. Actually, there's two new things to it. Um, the first thing that you'll notice when you upgrade to Potman 3.0 is that Potman will now show, and also build up for what it's worth, uh, they will show when you pull an image a prompt. So they will prompt you. So pretty much it, you can then you have to choose pretty much of the, the, the options that the unqualified search registries offer. So in this case, you can choose, you know, do I want to pull an image foo from the Fedora registry, from Docker Hub, from the Red Hat registry, CentOS registry. Um, that's at least in, in the Fedora universe. You know, there's uh, in the SUSE and OpenSUSE uh, universe, they, they will point to their registry. Um, I think Debian points to their own registry as well. So, so you see, there is a certain demand to not only use Docker Hub. So this is the first thing that we do. The intention behind is to make it explicit what the user wants. So we don't want to hide it um, or pretty much make it more obvious to users that they're using a short name and to think about it. 
most secure way is to always pull an image by digest. So fully quiet, fully qualified image reference and then the digest because uh, well, uh, it really needs to match what, you, what you're pulling. So this is the first thing that, that we implemented. Second thing is we came up with an idea. So we wanted to tackle now in the second part, the ambiguity of short names, which is introduced by the list of unqualified search registries. How we did it is, well, we, we're all uh, some old, old Unix, uh, Unix parts, so we're pretty much aliasing it. Imagine it like a bash alias where you have the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So if you go on github.com slash containers slash short names, you'll find a, a project. Okay, I have to speak quicker. Jen is reminding uh, us that we have three minutes left. Um, so we now ship a configuration file, which is also in, in the registries conf format. I will give a talk about registries conf and about this, um, or what I just mentioned also on Saturday afternoon or afternoon my time, if you're in the US, it's morning. Um, and this is now shipped or it's about to, to be shipped in Fedora and in RHEL. Other distros are contributing uh, to it as well. So this is really a community effort where if you then, for instance, do a Potman pull Debian, it will reach out directly to the Debian images. If you do a Potman pull Fedora, it will go directly to the Fedora registry. So there's no searching anymore. There's no ambiguity. And we know exactly what, what we're pulling uh, from there. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I, I hate short names because they cause me a lot of headache because I help maintain, um, the containers image library. Miloslav is the, the mastermind there. And I guess we, we share the, the headache and the, the pain a lot because this really introduces a lot of uh, ambiguity. Uh, but I'm happy about the feedback we, we received so far. There's also lots of interest from, from Microsoft and this is, this is pretty cool. Yeah, just a couple of other things. One, once you've chosen an image and pulled it down, then we will record your selection. So if you say, you know, Postgres SQL comes from Docker IO, you, the next time you run it, you won't have to, you know, we'll, we, we basically add an alias for that. And the other thing is, is companies that want to use Podband can specify their own aliases. So if you have, you know, for instance, Red Hat, uh, when the ship rel is going to have a list of all the images that Red Hat um, produces and they'll have their own aliases file that will ship as part of the uh, Red Hat distribution. Uh, but if you were a third party, if you're you know, a huge company and you want to have your images and guarantee that they only come from your registry, then you can have your own um, uh, registries.com. Uh, so we're running out of time here. I just wanted to say we're going to have a, uh, we're also having a containers um, plumbing days is coming up. That's going to be, I think, March 8th and 9th. Um, in a few weeks, and that's going to be uh, similar to DevConf, um, except totally focused. It's going to be a totally free conference, similar to this, um, but it's going to be totally uh, totally uh, concentrated on the low end stuff for containers, everything underneath Kubernetes, nothing, you know, none, none of the uh, CNF stuff or any of that, but it's going to be all fairly low level stuff. It's going to be a two day conference. Um, it's just going to talk about plumbing and you know, Giuseppe's hopefully going to have some talks on some of the crazy stuff that he's working on and other other people's in his team, but all, also all the other communities out there um, and lots of other companies are going to be participating in it. So I hope to see you there. How much does it cost look there? Containerplumbing.org, I think it is, right? Could someone drop a... Uh, it's, uh, I've decided to sponsor everybody for it so everybody can go for free. So. <laughs>